Hi, we're Pastors Corey and Melissa Inslee right here at the Exchange Worship Center. And we are so honored that you chose to tune in and watch us live. Man, get out your Bibles, your notebooks, follow along with the message. And we pray that it's a blessing to you this morning. We'll see you right after this message. But y'all ready for the word? Y'all ready? Uh, my good friend, my dear friend, we've known each other a hundred years and neither one of us looked that old. But we met when we were, he was a teenager and I was just getting into my adulthood, <laughs> adulthood, 20 years old or so, something like that. And I literally ran into him. And how can you miss him? I mean, he's eight feet tall and white as can be. How can you miss him? And we were both singing at a, an outdoor event uh, for church. And he, he was rapping and I was doing praise and worship with a, some, a team behind me and stuff to tracks. And I went over and somebody introduced me to him or something. And I went to shake his hand and I knocked his CD out of his hand. And the CD had all his tracks on it. He says, man, you know how expensive that thing is? And we've been friends ever since. Uh, it was almost like reenacting David and Goliath. I was like, no, sir. You know, he's like 16 or however old he was. And I was like 20. I was like, be a man, be a man, you know, and so, but but we've been friends ever since, and so um, I just love him to death. I love his family, and I'm sure he's going to introduce them, and so I don't want to steal that thunder. But if you'll please stand and welcome Pastor Roger Krause as he comes to bring the word. If you have a, a Bible, I want you to open up to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. It should be up here on the screen right above us. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, before I break this down, let me make you all laugh and smile real quick because I sweat a lot. It's not you. It's me. I'm fat. I'm tall. And I sweat a lot. So don't run and turn down the AC. I sweat, and these first two rows would be considered the splash zone, and I guess I would be considered Shamu. No, I'm just joking. No, but I do sweat a lot, so don't think, man, what's going on with that guy? He's nervous. I'm not nervous. I sweat. But God, God gave me this message Monday morning as I, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I began reading my Bible, and he talked to me about re reclaiming the high place to obtain the broad place. And you'll understand that as I go through this. But starting off in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Somebody say principalities. Against powers. Say powers. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Now say the rulers of the darkness of this world. And against spiritual wickedness. Say spiritual wickedness. In high places say in high places what does it mean when it talks about high places it would seem that spiritual wickedness could be so strong that no matter where it came in that it could attack us and knock us off track but he specifically says in high places here if you were to continue to read through here and it's not going to be on the screen i'm not going to read the scriptures but if you continue to read ephesians chapter 6 you would see that god begins to talk about the full armor and he says to put on the full armor of God. The full armor of God, I'm sure you guys know, is the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of peace, uh, which are the shoes and the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. How many people have heard about the full armor of God? This is what he continues to say after the Scripture that we just read. And then after that, he says, then all after all of that, he says to pray in all occasions. This means when things are going good, we must pray. When things are going bad, we must pray. When things are mediocre, we must pray. Prayer is our connection to God. So when we go back to the beginning, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, especially the end of us, when he says, against spiritual wickedness in high places, God showed me that there was an area that needs attention before we even step into the full armor of God. We have to deal with the high place. It all starts with reclaiming the high place in our lives. So what is that high place in our lives? What does it mean when it says spiritual wickedness in high places? 
Well, as I told you a few months ago, I was in Chicago and God spoke to me in the hotel room. And the reason why I was in this moment was I had flown to Chicago for a business trip and my wife is writing a book that will come out on Valentine's Day next year. It's about restoration in marriages that talks about our story and all of the things that we went through and helps those who are going through it to overcome it. And she asked me to write a little section about questions she thought men may have or that the spouse who did the wrong things may have in the relationship. So as I began to write this out, God began to deal with me about Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. And what he spoke to me specifically concerning Ephesians 6, 12 was the very last part, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So this is what I felt like he impressed upon me. Whatever wickedness, whatever it is, whether it's lust or whether it's pride or whether it's greed or whether it's envy or whether it's jealousy, whatever it is, if we allow it into our lives, even at the smallest amount that we can think of, even if it's just a small amount of pride that we open up the door to, it can come in, it can grow up, and all of a sudden it can take over the high place. So what this means is that it becomes so powerful in our lives that it begins to control us. You see me keep going like this when I say the high place because I truly believe that whenever sin creeps in, it's because we thought we could deal with it. Our mind took over and we said, it's okay to go to this place just for the night. Or it's okay to involve myself in this situation or this relationship or this act of sin just for the moment. Because afterwards, I can go back and I can live with grace and I can ask for repentance and everything will be all right. But what we don't understand is that the devil has even used the word of God against us to deceive us, to take that chance or what we would think as an opportunity to sin and then just to tell us that it's going to be okay. God's got you. It's going to be all right. But what we have to understand is that the devil, the thief in John chapter 10, verse 10 says that he comes in to steal, to kill and to destroy us. He doesn't come in to just to just uh, say, OK, you can sin tonight and be back in the arms of God tomorrow. He comes in to take control. The high place, I believe, starts off with our mind. It comes in and it takes it takes over and we think about the sin and we involve ourselves in the sin thinking that we can conquer it and that we're okay doing it. But he's saying that there is spiritual wickedness in high places. Whatever that wickedness is that comes into your life can rise up to the high place. It can take a higher position than God in your life. This is what he's talking about when he says in high places. Whatever that thing is that is coming into your life trying to control you is now creeping into a place where it's taking a higher place than God in your life. It could be a higher place in your mind. It could be a higher place in your heart. It could be a higher place in your physical body. But something is coming in and it is taking a higher place than where God resides at in your life. You know, I think back and I'm not going to share my testimony here today, but some of you all know who I am. You know what me and my wife went through. You know what I did, how I messed up. You know all of those things. And whenever I look back and I think about the thing that I did, there is something in that that is so painful. And the thing that is so painful when I think back is to think that I was the person who would have never done what I did. The thought of why did I do what I did whenever I said I would never do those type of things. I was the man who specifically looked at my wife and said I would never ever do those things. But yet I am the same person who did those very things. Why is it? It's because Satan comes in and he tries to kick open the door a little bit. And then when he walks in, he begins to play with your mind. He begins to play with your heart. He begins to play with your body. And what he is doing is steadily climbing the ladder saying, if I can get to that higher position in your life, I'll have full control. And at that point, I can come in and I can steal and I can kill and I can destroy you. That's what Satan tries to do in each one of our lives. So whenever he came in, in my specific situation, it started off with a, somebody who needed some help. And instead of referring that person to my wife, I took on the responsibility. 
And then all of a sudden, I'm spending time with this person. And then all of a sudden, it goes to another level, and it goes to another level. And then all of a sudden, it has came in and killed my ministry. It has came in and tried to destroy my marriage. It has came in and it has taken full control because I allowed that thing to take a higher place in my life than where God was. We have to be cognizant and aware of where we place God in our life and keep him at the highest place. He must be first. He must be before faith. He must be before Ethan and Marisa, my kids. He must be before everything in my life because if I don't keep him at the high place, something else will try and creep in and say, yeah, he says God's at the highest place, but let's really see what he's all about. This is one thing that we overlook so often is that spiritual realm that we have to deal with. You know, we don't battle against flesh and blood, but we battle against the spirit realm. Sin comes into our lives and it creates spiritual wickedness. That spiritual wickedness creeps in when you begin to allow things into your life that are not godly. You say, well, I would never do that. I thought I would never do that. I was preaching every Sunday in Boston, Massachusetts with a church that was thriving and growing. And still, even with that opportunity, studying the word and proclaiming the word, I still allowed something to come in and take a higher place in my life. You have to understand that once spiritual wickedness comes in and takes up residence and reaches for the higher place, it causes us to feel out of control with no stability at all. And when we stop submitting ourselves to God first, we have allowed the enemy to come in and take over that higher place. If we want to see why we have mass shootings all across America, it's because spiritual wickedness has taken a higher place than God in our country. That's exactly why we have people doing what they're doing. If you would know the full truth of my testimony, there was a night after I realized what I had been doing, that I was standing on a lake and I was going to commit suicide that night because spiritual wickedness had taken a higher place than God in my life. And I wanted to end it all. And the devil was probably sitting there saying, I got him. I got him. I got him. I got him. He's about to kill himself. But on the other end of that was God Almighty. And he was saying, I will fight for you. I will stand for you. I'm reaching out for you. Please reach out for me in the middle of this. And in that moment, in that situation, standing on that lake, wanting to kill myself, I felt the presence of God. And I immediately chose to walk back home to God and give him the higher place in my life. So what breaks this trap, this endless cycle of defeat? What can be done? How does breakthrough come in the midst of the wickedness residing in the high place of our lives? First, we must recognize what is happening off stage, what is happening behind the scenes, what is happening in the private We have to recognize that whenever we leave this place, the enemy is coming in and he's trying to see who he can devour. He's coming in and he's testing your faith. He's saying, yeah, I saw you Sunday at church. I saw your hands raised. I saw you giving in the offering. I saw you go to the altar. I heard you say the prayer, but I'm still going to test you. I'm still going to try you. I'm still going to try and take control of that high place in your life. The saddest thing is that whenever you run into people who have allowed spiritual wickedness to take the high place in their life, they are not in full control of their lives, but they are merely puppet, a puppet on a string. They are basically being moved by Satan. We don't talk about spiritual wickedness in churches very often because it's a deep, deep subject. But I want you to know that it's so, so real. When somebody goes live on Facebook and shoots another person in the face, it's because they're a puppet on the string and spiritual wickedness has taken over in their life. More now than ever, we have to take a position and say that God is first in my life. God is in the high place of my life. God is in the high place of my job. God is in the high place of my ministry. God is in the high place of how I raise my kids. God is in the high place of how I love my wife. And once we get to the place where we wake up every single morning and we bow down before our God and say, God, you're in control. You are in the high place. I placed you here this morning in the high place of my life. Then all of a sudden we realize that we are not being controlled by 
by Satan anymore, but we are being controlled by God who opens up the windows of heaven to bless us, to pour out a blessing through us. I want you to look at something that in the midst of living a lie, if you will learn to put on the full armor of God, meaning put on truth, then things can change for a positive in a positive way for you. In the middle of wickedness, if you can just learn to wake up in the morning and put on righteousness, then things can change for you. If you are living in the midst of trouble, you can put on peace every single morning. If you're living in the midst of separation, you can put on salvation. If you're living in the midst of defeat, you can put on the Spirit of God and walk freely every day here upon this earth. God came that we might have freedom. This may seem difficult to some, but let me remind you that the enemy even tried to enter into the high place of our Savior, Jesus Christ. In the garden, he came in and he began to tempt him. And he began to try and tell, knock him off the course. But even in that situation, Jesus overcame the enemy. If Jesus overcame the enemy and he's living inside of you, I want you to know that you can overcome the enemy as well. When Jesus was leaving this earth, he said to us that he was leaving us his Holy Spirit. And that same Holy Spirit that came and broke the spiritual wickedness upon this earth back then, when he took the weight of our sin upon his back, and he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And they put him in the tomb, and the Holy Spirit rose him from the dead. That same Holy Spirit is now residing with you, and it can cause you to overcome anything death hell and the grave are no match for you if you have the holy spirit living inside of you my god is a way maker he holds all power and authority my god is an addiction breaker if you're struggling with some type of addiction god is an addiction breaker my God, he defeated, defeated the devil and he has provided a way out of captivity and a way into your freedom. But you got to let him work on your behalf and you have to place him at the high place. You have to activate him in your life. Yeah, you've accepted him, but have you activated him? Unleash him in your life, in your dry season, in your broken marriage, in the addiction to drugs or alcohol, into your depression. Activate God. Bring him on the scene. Don't just believe in God, but open up your arms and activate him into your situation. Activate God in your high places. You might be asking me how. Well, if you were to continue to read Ephesians chapter 6, you would see that he's telling us to put on truth to put on righteousness, to put on peace, to put on faith, to put on salvation, and to put on the Spirit. You see, God provides all that we need, but He tells us to put it on. Salvation is Him giving us a free gift. Overcoming everything in our life is us giving it back to God and saying, I'll put on the full armor of God every day of my life. Once we do this, understand that freedom is just around the corner. The Bible says that weeping may endure for the night, but hold on because joy is coming in the morning. I don't want you to get into a, a, a fight and think that you're, you're fighting this thing out on a physical level when you really need to be fighting it out on a spiritual level. And that brings me to the second point that I feel led to share with you today. So this is talking about reclaiming the high place, high place but now I want to speak to you about obtaining the broad place. Does anybody know what I mean by broad place? If you think you have an understanding, just put your hand up. Let me see it. The broad place. Just say the broad place. The broad place. The broad place is a place that is wide open. It's a place that has no limits. It's a place to where it, whenever you look at it, there are no boundaries. A broad place is something that is large. Something that has been enlarged. I want to read this verse in, in Job chapter 36, verse 16. And it, it, go ahead and put it up on the screen above me. It says, Even so would he have removed thee out of the strait into a broad place. Out of the strait and into a broad place where there is no straightness and that which should be set on thy table should be full of fatness. Whenever you talk about being full of fatness, that means that nothing is being held back from you. 
God is blessing you and blessing you and blessing you and blessing you. God is making a way where there seems to be no way. He's coming into your life and you feel like you're being trapped in a straight situation. And he's saying, I have a broad place for you. Baby, come up here real quick. Let me take this off and illustrate it. While I'm taking this off, everybody say straight place. me and tie the arms around my back. What she's doing is she's making a straight jacket, essentially. She's making something. Don't tie it too tight now. I don't want to have to call on God to get me out of the jacket now. <laughs> I'm going to need your help. Stay up here. So now I'm in a straight place. My arms are tied here. If I want to go reach for the Bible or for my iPad here that has the Bible on it, it's a little more difficult than having full range of motion. I'm not in a broad place where everything is available to me. I'm in a straight place where I'm limited on what I can do. What we often do as people is we physically react to this and we start going like this. How am I going to get out of the straight jacket? How am I going to get out of the straight place? And we start to try and flex our muscle. We try and break free from it. And we start thinking, okay, well, if I remember what happened on MacGyver back in the day, I can maybe go like this and, and pull something and get free from it. Or if I can just get to my phone and watch a YouTube video on how to get out of a straight jacket, it would work. But what God is saying in Job chapter 36, it's still on the screen, right? It says, even so would he have removed thee out of the straight into a broad place where there is no straightness and that which should be set on thy table should be full of fatness. God wants our lives to be unlimited. God wants our faith to be unlimited. He wants our love to be unlimited. He does not like it when he looks down and sees his children being restricted because of something straight like a straight jacket or a straight place. But he wants us to have freedom. He wants us to have abundance. He wants us to enter into a place of broad, a broad place. There's a verse in the Bible, it's not on the screens, but it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in good health. We should understand that God loves us so much that whenever we physically trying, if we can get the understanding that it's a spiritual battle and not a physical battle, that we can go to God and say, God, I'm stuck here. I can't move my arms. I'm in a straight place. And you told me in your word that you had a broad place for me. Can you please take this weight off of my shoulders? God comes into our lives and he begins to work things out. And he takes that thing off that is holding us captive. And he opens us up to freedom. So now my hands are not confined. I can raise my hands and worship him. I can lift up my heart and say, God, here I am. Put, I'm putting you back in the high place. No longer am I being bound by something that is constraining me. But that thing has been tossed to the side. And here I am, all alive in Jesus Christ. And I am entering into a broad place. A place without limits. A place to where whenever I feel a little bit depressed, I can freely reach for the Word of God. Because my arms aren't bound. My mind isn't bound. My heart isn't bound. Nothing is bound whenever God takes us into the broad place. Job, we just read out of the book of Job. Job, you have to understand, Job was an upright man. Job was on fire for God. Job was a family man. Job was a wealthy man. Job was always bragging on God and what God did for him. But what you have to understand is that Job found himself in a situation that he never expected to be in. Because you would assume that if you're on fire for God and you got all the money in the world and you have all the possessions that you need, that all things are going to be okay. But despite that, Satan said to God, I see Job. He praises you. He loves you. He talks about you all the time. But let's take away that church building. Let's take away that pulpit. Let's take away the crowds. Let's take away the money. Let's take away all the 
the family. Let's take away all of the animals. Let's take away all the possessions and see where Job ends up at. You see, Satan was trying to enter into Job and capture the high place in his life. Satan tried everything in his power to shake Job, but Job just wouldn't shake. Job continued on. Now, don't get me wrong. Job complained. Job questioned some things because that is our natural reaction to do that. But he never once denied God. Job lost his possessions. He lost his wealth. He was really going through it. He complains a bit and he gets down a bit, but he never folds or denies God. Job even lost his entire family at that time with the exception of one person, his wife. If you read the book of Job, he did not lose his wife. He lost his kids, he lost his money, he lost his possessions, but he did not lose his wife. So God revealed something to me here. Satan, with full reign allowed by God to come in and destroy Job and to try and get him to turn on God, he takes his money, he takes his possession, he takes his family, but he does not take his wife. Why? Because God preserved the very thing that Job would need to recreate the blessings that God had for him. The very thing that Job needed to reproduce and recreate all the things that he had before could not be destroyed by the enemy because God said, I'm going to raise up a standard. You can come in, you can take his money. You can come in and you can take his possessions, take his kids, take all of those things. But don't touch his wife because later on in the Bible, you're going to read something in, in, uh, in uh, let's see here. In Job chapter 42, it's not on the screen, but you'll see, so the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than the beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand she donkeys. He had also seven sons and three daughters. Because God preserved his wife, they were able to go back and do something that married people do and recreate the blessing that God had for them all the time. So whenever you're going through it, hang on and know that God is on your side. When you've lost some money along the way, just know that God is on your side. Whenever you've lost a loved one along the way, know that God is on your side. Whenever you look at the bank account, there's no money. You go to the doctor and there's a bad health report and you're trying to struggle. Maybe you got fired from your job. Just know that God is preserving the very thing that will bring back everything to you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He owns the thousand upon a, a cattle upon a thousand hills. He owns everything. He has it all in store for you and he's not going to remove the very thing that will cause you to be blessed in your future. You just have to get a vision of what that thing is. Because if we're constantly focusing on the wrong thing, we'll never see the great thing that he's left us that'll cause us to walk into our blessing. The last thing I want to share is Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. I have this slide for this one. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind, the high place, the thoughts, be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? What was the mindset of Christ Jesus? Did Christ Jesus walk through his life here upon this earth defeated? Whenever they took his clothes, did he say, man, I just can't go on? Whenever they beat him, with all types of weapons, whenever they pushed the crown of thorns into his brow, did he say, I just can't make it? Whenever they mocked him and spit upon him, did he say, I just can't make it? He went into the garden and there he fervently prayed. I can see him in this very moment bowing down and saying, God, if there is another way, please let this cup be removed from me. But he never said, I won't do it. He said, nevertheless, your will, not my will. Jesus, the mind of Christ here upon this earth, was a mindset that said, no matter what happens to me, I'm going to that cross. I'm going to that cross for each and every person that's sitting here under my voice today. 
I'm going to that person who's shooting up in the hallway right now. I'm going to that person who's drowning himself in the liquor right now. I'm going to that person. I'm going to that place for the person who was in the wrong bed at this time. I'm going to that place because my people need redemption from their sins. The mindset of Christ is a mindset of completion. And you have to understand that as you go through this life, you're going to lose some things. You're going you're gonna to have to throw away some things. Some things are going to be taken from you. But the mindset of Christ says, I'm going to complete the work no matter what it takes. Christ's mind was already looking to the resurrection from the tomb while he was still on live on the earth before being hung upon the cross. Get your mindset on the end goal. Jeremiah chapter 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. They are thoughts of good and not evil. To give you and bring you to an expected end. The end is what your mindset must be. Don't get caught up in the money. Don't get caught up in the fame. Don't get caught up in the buildings. Don't get caught up in the environments. But get caught up in the end goal of what God has placed in your life. Whatever it is, allow God to be the end goal. So whenever everything else comes and goes, comes and goes like waves in the ocean, you can say it's all good because I'm looking past the waves and I'm looking to my destiny. I'm looking to that place that God told me he was going to take me. I'm looking to my marriage being restored because God said he would do it. I'm looking to my teenager or my kid in college that is no longer living for God to come back home because he told me there's an expected end. And in this moment, it doesn't seem like it's all working out. But he says he's working it out. There's a spiritual battle going on. Just like Satan tries to come and knock us off course, he tries to come and knock them off course. But there's an expected end. So hang on. Hold on. And the best way that you can hang on and to hold on is to put God back in the high place. Put God back in the high place of your thoughts. Put God back in the high place of your heart. And put God back in the high place of your actions. And see that God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Everybody stand with me real quick. Everybody stand with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, I come to you right now and I pray, Lord, that this Word went forth and that it touched somebody's life. It touched somebody's heart. It touched somebody's mind, God. Lord, that they, they face, they're facing a situation currently to where it seems like all hell is breaking loose. They feel like Job. They're saying, God, where are my possessions? Why would you take my children? Why would you allow Satan to come in here and wreck my life? I've given you praise forever. I've been a very successful man, a very loving man, and I've shown you love every step of the way, God, but still you allowed him to come in and take some things from me. But just like Job, he complained a bit, he murmured a bit, he questioned things a bit, but he never denied God. Get to the place in your life where you will never deny God. And then when it's all said and done, you can look back and say, yeah, the devil thought he won there. He took all of these things, but he did not take Job's wife. I want to propose to you here this morning, as the music is playing softly in the background, I want to encourage you and I want to engage you to look around for that one thing that God has not allowed to be taken away from you. And that one thing will cause you to return to the place of that blessing. Hey everyone, thank you for watching. Man, we pray that this message was a blessing to you. We pray that it did something inside of you, encouraged you, and inspired you for greatness in the things of God. If you're ever in the Corpus Christi area, come check us out at the EWC. We're located at 6801 Weber Road. And if you feel like God is calling you to be a blessing to this ministry, go on our website, theexchangewc.com. Dot org. There'll be some instructions on there to help you out. Otherwise, we love that you joined us. We'll see you next time right here at the EWC.